Hi everyone, this is Chris Campbell with the Food Institute, and today I'm joined by our CEO Brian Choi as we welcome Ariane Dagwin, CEO of D'Artagnan, and we'll be discussing her company's history, how the meat market has changed over the past 25 years, how COVID affected operations, and the future growth opportunities for her company. But first, before we get started, I'd like to ask all of our listeners today to share this episode with their friends and family. It's a huge help to us, and I wanted to thank everyone who's done so before. And if you're new to the podcast, please like, comment, and share, as it extends our reach, and we really appreciate it when you do so. So with that said, welcome to the show, Arian. How are you? Hello. I'm fine. I'm fine. How are you, Chris? <laughs> We're doing pretty well. Um, and I think where we can start the conversation today, just to give people a little bit more of a background on your company, if they're not familiar, I think maybe you could uh, just share a little bit about your background, your company, and the mission behind D'Artagnan. Well, D'Artagnan is a 36 years old company. Uh, I uh, founded when I arrived from uh, France after a couple of failed studies at Columbia University, uh, but big opportunity. And, and it's just that uh, I come from a long line of uh, people in the food business. Uh, my family, I mean, we count, I'll be the seventh generation, my daughter, the eighth generation in the food business, in the restaurant business. Um, in France, I'm the one who migrated to America. And um, D'Artagnan was founded on the premises that um, at the beginning, uh, chefs from restaurants needed a better quality meat protein, uh, whether it's poultry or meat. But basically, uh, pieces of meat that came from animals that were well raised to have the top quality possible, because 36 years ago, there was none of that. It was very much uh, factory farming and nothing else. And so that's where we grew. And then we diversified little by little. And so now today we are selling to the best chefs of America, but also to uh, discerning consumers by e-commerce and to a whole array of uh, retailers uh, and retail chains. Uh, and we stayed very much specialized in the best meat, poultry, game meat possible, you know, uh, coming from animals that are well raised, no antibiotics, no growth hormones, organic when possible, but surely with plenty of room to roam around because that's what builds the muscles. No stress or as little stress as possible especially in transport, because that's where it's the most sensitive for animals. And then in the process, same thing, as little stress as possible and no water added, you know, air chilled, so that at the end, the mission of D'Artagnan, our mission number one, is to obtain excellence in the plate, in the middle of the plate. Thanks for sharing that, Ariane. D'Artagnan's products are known in the industry as not only being top quality, but also humanely raised, organic, and free range. These terms are widely used today by many companies, but D'Artagnan was a pioneer before these terms became popularized. Can you share a bit about the philosophy of D'Artagnan as it relates to these terms and business practices? Well, the, so it's basically two, two questions. The first one is about uh, uh, using those buzzwords and, uh, hey, it's fair game. This is called marketing, you know? Uh, when I arrived in this country, gourmet was the, uh, the buzzword, you know? And once gourmet was on every deli, every bodega, every piece of uh, uh, label in America, then it went up to uh, farm to table. So, <laughs> so yeah, we are proud to say that we were the first ones to uh, do farm to table, but the real one. And, and, uh, to uh, have no compromise about it. And so um, uh, it was very difficult at the beginning and not necessarily for the reason that you would think, you know, farmers were always, and it depends which farmers, but small independent farmers and ranchers uh, were always welcoming us. Uh, they were a little doubtful at the beginning, but there were communities of Amish um, uh, farmers in Pennsylvania, in Indiana, in Arkansas that were really ready to follow our specifications because that's how they were uh, living their uh, vocation uh, and their life. You know, they, um, uh, their motto is to live 
the um, the terroir to leave the um, the legacy in as good a, a shape, if not better, than what uh, was given to them. So of course, the uh, the herd of animals is a, is part of that. It's it's to to put things in better shape instead of destroying and depleting uh, the resources. Um, and so we found uh, very easily um, a good ear for uh, uh, for us there in those communities, uh, but also elsewhere. I mean, there is a, a ranch in Texas uh, owned by Tia Strube. She's, I think, the only woman rancher who raises Wagyu, but not any Wagyu, Wagyu beef, without any antibiotics nor growth hormones from birth and who actually feed the animals, not in feedlots, but in the field, but, you know, giving them grain every day, but in the field. So things like that. So at, at the beginning, we asked what we could, you know, to have the best chicken possible, meaning just having as much space as possible outside. Uh, and to the processor, well, don't mess it up too much, you know. The, I mean, we couldn't, uh, we didn't have volume, we didn't have a voice. But as we grew and we became uh, more credible in the uh, eyes of uh, uh, our uh, vendors, whether it's the farmer or the processor, then they took us more seriously. And today we have a vendor packet that is that thick where um, the, the, uh, the breeders and the, 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 uh, the farmers and the ranchers have to explain how they raise have to um, guarantee that there is no medication ever, that if an animal needs medication, it will, put, it will be put outside of our program. Um, and uh, very stringent specs also on the transportation. It's a big deal, the transportation, because America is a big country, so live transportation has to be very respectful of the animal with ventilation, with shadows, with space. You know, um, and then stress-free uh, transfers to the process to the processor. Uh, Temple Grandin is a woman who really uh, advances the cause there and really understands um, what causes animals to get stress. And so she helped a lot in those processing places, those slaughterhouses. Um, and little by little explaining to the slaughterhouse, especially the poultry ones, how important it is not to use uh, water and to air chill at the end so that there is a concentration of taste in the, um, uh, in the poultry instead of a dilution in uh, ice water. And then from there, it's our job at D'Artagnan uh, with our um, operation, our logistics, uh, to bring it to the last mile, the freshest possible and in as good shape, you know, in the, at the right temperature, etc. And um, so that's what we've been doing. Um, again, it was difficult 36 years ago, not so much with the farmers, but certainly with the uh, slaughterhouses. Today is very, very easy with the farmers. They are knocking at the door. You know, we have people and, and they, they ask us what you want us to, to raise for you. And so it's more about logistics and making sure that there is a group of farmers that is as close as possible to the closest slaughterhouse. The bottleneck is the processing, the slaughterhouse. So we've been working with Cornell, we've been working with Farm Bureau in different states to entice uh, cooperative or community-driven small slaughterhouses that are more in the middle of regional independent farmers and that can help process their animals. Because as we saw in the COVID uh, time uh, this last year, um, we the food chain became very, very fragile because we are dependent on too few, too humongous processing places. And so when they fall down because something happens there, whether people get sick or whatever, then the whole chain messes up. You know, you have farmers who don't know where to put their pigs anymore because you have the next pigs coming on and there is no, no more room. 
And, and, and then you have on the other side the consumer who's panicking for nothing because there is a glut of meat, but there is just not enough um, uh, ways of processing them. Um, so I think, and that wasn't part of your question, but I think if there is something to remember from COVID, and there are a couple of things, but one big one is to really look at our food chain and to encourage uh, of course, we need those big uh, processors and there is no uh, way around it, but we need additional smaller ones that are closer to the market and that are uh, more geared for um, uh, specialty uh, meat. You know, the quail, the rabbit, the pheasants, the guinea hens and the heritage anything, heritage chicken, heritage pig, heritage lamb. Yeah. So we already talked a little bit about the operational challenges of COVID, but I was wondering too, as a leader of a food company during the pandemic, what was that experience like? What kind of shifts did you need to make in your leadership, kind of contending with the pandemic and, you know, leading a group of people in your company? What kind of changes did you have to make? Well, talking about not sleeping at night, <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> um it was very, very frightening, especially at the beginning, you know, from March to July, every day was a challenge. Every day there was a new hurdle. Every day there was a surprise hook, you know, whether it's receivables or whether it's a food chain and the uh, the supply or whether it's uh, uh, retail stores uh, panicking, wanting anything at any cost and then realizing that, uh, no, maybe this is not right. I mean, it's it, it was that plus the uh, insecurity of the next day, you know, of, uh, I mean, w you have to realize in on March 14, 75% um, of our business, the restaurants closed down. The whole country, the whole restaurant closed down, 75% of our business. So we had to do something really fast and without panicking. And I'm very fortunate to have an extraordinary team here uh, with me. And we've been following the culture of D'Artagnan. You know, D'Artagnan really existed. He was a, not just a character in Alexandre Dumas' book, but he was a real man from Gascogne, my hero, the hero of all Gascogne. This is why I call my company D'Artagnan. And his motto and the motto of the Musketeers was all for one, one for all. And that was my motto. That was the motto of D'Artagnan, the company, since 36 years ago when we started. And I think that that culture helped a lot, you know, because um, from wherever facet of the company, uh, people were not just there for the what's in it for me, for the, uh, hey, uh, how do I save my uh, skin? But for the, hey, if we don't make it together, nobody's going to make it. So we need to support the weaker ones in our group and we need to be there all together. And that allowed us, one, not to panic and two, to be able to pivot with much more agility than a big corporation that wouldn't have that uh, possibility. So uh, basically overnight, all our salespeople from the restaurant and hotel uh, department were transferred into uh, e-commerce and um, retail, mostly retail, and going to look after those clients that uh, were new to us and that we didn't have uh, the day before. And uh, we got trained to really look at every facet. And then budget-wise, we put all our money into e-commerce, um, strategically looking at it, um, how to market and do promotions uh, judiciously, but also uh, the money for uh, advertising, um, you know, click uh, advertising, the money for search engines, the money for bells and whistles on the website. I mean, we really, really ramped it up um, really fast. And so it allowed us, even though we had a dip at one point of like 90% of the sales of Manhattan, you know, the restaurants were everything, we were able to hold our own. We 
uh, in the year, we were never uh, below minus 15%. So uh, we were at minus 15%. And, um, and today, I'm proud to say we're in, well, I mean, it's, it's not difficult. It's March and, and uh, the whole pandemic started in March last year. But that's it. We're already way above where we were not only in 2020, but also in, in 2019. So we have reversed the, uh, I mean, when you look at the, uh, the chart, it's pretty, uh, uh, it's pretty drastic. You know, you see a big hill going up sharply and then a big dip. And then from that dip, the going back up is even at a, a sharper angle than before. So uh, we're, we're, uh, we're very proud of that. I'm very proud of the whole team. Um, and and I, I really am convinced without that culture of all for one, one for all, we could not have made it like that. That's fascinating. And, and the fact that you guys are, are doing sales above what you were last year and, and right now the the dining rates in Manhattan were still only at 50%. So as it goes back to full 100%, that's going to mean further growth opportunity, especially as the food service sector um, recovers. Totally. But but don't forget, we have five distribution centers. Um, we have uh, Macon, Georgia, uh, Houston, Texas, um, Chicago, Illinois, and uh, Denver, Colorado. And so we provide for places that didn't suffer that much or that are booming right now. Uh, from here huh, in Union, New Jersey, we, um, we go to uh, Boston and then Rhode Island, Cape Cod, uh, Long Island. Uh, that was very successful. Westchester, upstate New York, you know, those places where there was nothing two years ago. And all of a sudden, plenty of restaurants and little inns sprouts, sprouted all over the place. Um, Hamptons were Every New Yorker that had uh, family and some financial means sent their uh, uh, family uh, there. And so where the restaurants, even last summer, were doing really, really fine. And Florida, I mean, Florida, it's unbelievable. It's, uh, you don't think there was a pandemic anywhere. I mean, that if one state took an opportunity from the whole country is Florida. It's unbelievable. That's fascinating. I have a question related to plant-based meats, but before we get there, I wanted to ask you what trends have you seen pre and post pandemic as it relates to specialty meat consumption? Ma'am, I don't think I unearthed anything uh, earth shattering. You know, it's uh, just the logic at the beginning when we started this company, it was all about factory farm and in the restaurant business all around not doing factory farm, but trying to do something uh, better. Um, then uh, you could see that there was, um, I hate the word exotic, but there was a demand for different meat from different animals in the restaurant. Uh, and that's how venison and bison and wild boar and um, uh, uh, baby lambs and, and suckling pigs and quail pheasant rabbit, that's how it started to develop. And to this day, this is where most of those meats uh, end up eh, in the restaurant, not really um, in retail yet. And then, during the pandemic, we saw that one people started to cook more and so um, uh, wanted to experiment with things that they had tasted in restaurants. And so we did see, even though the beef and chicken trend was way up there, we could see that little by little consumers were um, uh, attracted by uh, little different meats. Um, and now that uh, little by little restaurants are reopening, we see a, a little bit of a convection of, you know, a, a joining of forces, if you uh, wish, for the same kind of things, which is on the consumer side, convenience. Uh, it's logical, but they don't want to buy a whole ribeye. They want to buy a whole, you know, a steak that uh, will be ready to put in the pan. But same thing with the restaurants. Um, they've suffered a lot. 
um, they might not have been able to regain all their labor force. And so they do need also those portion controls, those, that convenience of um, not having to uh, break down a whole carcass of animal because they don't have the labor to do that. They don't have the time um, and, and they have to be at their most efficient right now. Um, I, I don't know if that's going to stay or not in the restaurant, uh, but it's certainly a big, um, a big, big trend right now. Uh, but I know it's logical that it stays in the consumer. I personally, I'd rather bring steaks at home than again a whole, you know, tenderloin and having to freeze some because we're not that big of a family. Thanks for sharing that, Ariane. This leads me to my next question. Plant-based meats and products have garnered much attention over the past few years. As a leading purveyor of specialty meats, what, what is your view on plant-based do you view it as a direct threat to your business, a necessary alternative to combat climate change, or even as a complement to traditional meats? Please share. There are two kinds of plant-based. Plant-based, which is basically uh, plant-based dishes, and that means putting carrots and cooking them properly and eating them, and I'm all for that. You know, uh, vegetables are very tasty, very important, and when they are very fresh and freshly picked, they are very good and ripe also when they are picked right. Um, and then there is a plant-based uh, wave to try to imitate meat, you know? And that's something that I don't understand. I don't think it has a huge future in the shape it is today. Um, I understand why uh, millennials and, and young people would want to eat a burger of made with plants instead of factory farm beef. That part I understand, and I think that's the big wave today. But little by little, people are going to realize that one, it's not as tasty anyway, and two, it's not that good for the earth anyway and the planet. You know, because we are encouraging a huge monoculture of uh, soy uh, and deforestation uh, to put all that soy in there. And why? To have something that imitates badly the taste of meat? Why? What's the point? I mean, have you tried uh, one of those burgers? I'm sorry, I, I don't understand. You know, it's just not good. So, Will there be progress in there? I'm sure there will be. You know, there were millions and millions of dollars every day uh, thrown into uh, R&D for those companies. So are they going to be able to uh, make up a, a, a steak uh, imitation that is so, so close to the real thing that, you know, we could get caught? It's possible, but why? What's the point when it is so rewarding, respectful of the earth, and and healthy to eat a steak from a cow or a beef that has led a good life that was uh, in the pasture all the time that didn't ever get medications that didn't pollute because it's good to have a uh, not in feedlot but in the pasture it's good to have um, animals we need biodiversity we need their poop to fertilize. I mean, there are ways to do things like our ancestors were doing it, helped by technologies of today, you know, so we're not, we're not burying our uh, head in the sand. But there are ways to do things the right way and to be good for the planet too. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great message. And I think there's a lot of education that needs to happen in the market today because the way companies are marketing themselves, there's a lot of false information out there. Right. And so I think having your voice, uh, you know, to share with it, with the industry, I think it's an important voice and one I think that needs to happen more. Right. Not just for yourself, but for other, you know, companies in the in the traditional meat category. So really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'd like to switch gears just a little bit here. And I think you alluded to it earlier in the conversation. But in 2020, you did celebrate your 35th anniversary. So I was wondering if you could give a little insight into your own beliefs on, you know, why your company was so successful and has lasted, you know, three and a half decades at this point. Uh, you're asking the wrong people. Eh? <laughs> uh, 
is because we were good and dedicated and passionate and uh, because uh, I somewhere uh, I'm, I know I'm convinced it's because it's not just about money and uh, when it is not just about money when when there is an authenticity behind it when there is a true passion behind it from all the team members involved it's gonna work you know did we make mistakes did we make uh, as many or more mistakes than any other company of course we did but we were able to to overcome i think because of that that passion and it is so so re- i mean i go back to the what i was saying the hospitality business and the, you know you're gonna think i'm a dreamer uh, in uh, la la land over there but it is true when you see those chefs and i've seen more chefs in my life than than a lot of people you know i talk to them every day i see them every day they are my clients my friends uh, and they are the place where i go to eat uh, most of the time so i know a lot of them and and i can tell you with certainty who's going to succeed and who's not and it's not because they are talented at the stove uh, this is part of it of course you need to have creativity and you need to be a good chef, you know, to be to have talent at the stove, but to be successful, you need to be generous. It's there is something intangible in there that you will see and and look at it. You know, the best chefs, the most successful chefs today in the world are the people who take happiness from giving happiness with food. If you don't have that. There is something missing that eventually is going to make you uh, trip and, and not succeed. I'm serious. I'm serious. Of course, we're doing this for money. All of us at the end, we need to be profitable. We need to be um, responsible for all the employees we have. But if you don't have that drive huh, to see in your restaurant uh, people sitting and being happy and beaming with joy in that little part of their life that they dedicated to you, you know, that they, they came to you for that. If you don't have that um, that happiness to, to want and to, to give you the will to make them happy, it's not going to work the same way and it's going to transpire. It's going to transpire. So... Um, I hope to think that at D'Artagnan, the whole team is also like that, you know, that we are indirectly because we don't see the end client eating in the, and that's a very big frustration sometimes, but still we are very um, to the tune and to the, to the listening of the intermediary, uh, whether it is a professional chef or the home cook. Words of words of wisdom that I think a lot of millennial and Gen Z, um, you know, folks need, uh, should should hear, and I hope many do eventually hear this podcast because I, I I completely agree with you. So thanks for thanks for sharing that. Thank you, Brian. As a follow up question, you know, where do you see the company going over the next few to five years? There's obviously been a tremendous growth um, as you cel- just celebrated your 35th anniversary. As you look out three to five or even 10 years, where uh, where do you see D'Artagnan going? Is there something new or that um, that you're thinking of or is it is it, you know, is it keeping on the same course that you're, you're on right now? Um, so right now we have to keep an eye on the future big time, of course, and budgeting and starting to look at, uh, the, uh, the next fiscal year because our year ends uh, end of June anyway. So we're, we're ready to do that. We have to finish cleaning up and make sure that, uh, the pandemic is behind us and wherever it's not, you know, how to, uh, transition, how to go back to, um, uh, the same service, you know, we, we did have to cut some truck roads. We did have to do whatever we had to do. We have to go back to normal. The farmers have to go back to normal. You know, it's a whole infrastructure um, that has to be put together. And that's on the very short term. On the long term, the budget for uh, the couple of next years look like 
is going to be good and and there is a big question how much how much um uh, restaurants are going to uh, sustain that huge back growth that uh, uh, is happening right now. Um, what are going to be the new rules for the restaurant business? And that is still up in the air and there are things changing there. On the consumer side and e-commerce, is e-commerce going to um, uh, tap down a little bit because people are going to go back more to restaurants? Um, are people all going to go back to work commuting or half of them or a quarter of them? Uh, you read things that are all over the place right now. So we have to look at all of that and to figure out what to do with e-commerce and the website and what to do with retail and with restaurants. Then five years, 10 years, who knows? Uh, we, this is a young crew, a young team. I'm the oldest mother hen in there. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, I love what I do. And uh, uh, you're going to have to take me out with, uh, you know, with, with uh, big difficulties. And uh, so it's always been difficult for me to talk about the future and the long term. Uh, and simply because I like what I do. And, and so I don't see myself doing something else. We, with my daughter, we started a foundation and that's the first D'Artagnan farm. Uh, it's called All for One, One for All. It's in Goshen, New York. And we have uh, big projects to uh, be able to open it to the public uh, soon and to uh, show how uh, the circle of life in food in is i mean not only in food but certainly in food you know how how the compost uh, arrives the worms fertilize the earth the earth grow the stuff to feed us and the animals and what to do with the animals and and uh, then how to process them and then how to eat them and the that whole conscience that whole circle um, I think somebody has to follow it and to, to understand it at one point or another. I mean, it's not about, um, it's simply about children understanding what a, a chicken should look like and that it shouldn't look like that rectangle of uh, breaded, uh, awful, uh, dry stuff, you know? So I want to thank... Ariane, for our time today, um, if someone wants to learn more about your company, where should they go? Uh, to the website, www.dartanian.com. That's D-A-R-T-A-G-N-A-N.com. All right, perfect. And we'll definitely share a link to that in the description of this episode. And like I said, I think that brings us to the end of today's session. So remember, if you're new to the Food Institute podcast, please follow, like, and share. And if you'd like to learn more about the Food Institute, please take a look at the links in our description to learn more about us and what membership can do for you and your company. So until next time, this is Chris Campbell signing off. Mm -hmm.